What is up, everybody? Well, today is the day we are finally here. Over the last week or so, I've been going through all of my end of the year list, ranking all of the comic book films of the year, all of the horror films of the year, giving my top 10 worst, my most surprising, most disappointing. And now we have landed at the cream of the crop, the top 10 best films of 2023. And it needs to be said, of course, just like with all these videos, I get sick of saying it, but I always feel like I need to say it. These are just my picks. These are my favorite movies of 2023, of which I saw like over 120 of them. So these absolutely stood above the pack for many different reasons. It's actually a pretty nice varied list this year. Some years my top 10 feels a little bit dominated by a specific genre that's just hitting that year, uh, but it's a really nice varied list this year. A lot of diversity in here. So very cool that it ended up being that way. Please let me know your top 10 down below in the comment section. And of course, if you haven't seen all the other videos, go and check those out and finish out with the top 10 best of the year. Finish out with the creme de la creme, the kings of 2023, the the gold winners, whatever the fuck else you want to call them. The best movies, goddammit. Let's talk about them. Also, I will not be given any honorable mentions because here probably sometime this weekend, if not the early part of next week, I'm going to be doing a full ranking of every film that I saw in 2023, of which right now I'm at 120. I might be able to squeeze one or two more movies in, but a shitload. Last year, I think I topped out at 86. So 40 plus movies more than I saw last year. Look forward to all of that. But as far as the top 10 best of 2023, we're going to kick this bitch off with my number 10. And while this shouldn't really surprise me, it kind of did surprise me that this cracked my top 10. And that's Killers of the Flower Moon, Martin Scorsese's newest movie. Now, listen, I love Martin Scorsese. You can't take anything away from the guy. I don't really have any criticisms towards him or his filmography. There's a number of movies that he's made that I have not seen yet, but movies like Goodfellas, The Departed, like in my top 15 of all time easy goodfellas in my top five so i love this guy when he does his best work but over the last number of years the types of stories that he's decided to tell haven't necessarily been for me even the irishman which kind of taps back into that mob stuff was a very different type of mob story it was very long a lot more uh, slow burn storytelling than i, I prefer in in that subgenre. so I, I really wasn't sure what to expect from Killers of the Flower Moon. I didn't know a whole lot about what the plot of the movie actually was. I try to go into uh, most movies blind nowadays if I can help it. And uh, all I really knew was the cast and a, a vague idea of what time period this was going to be setting in. Other than that, walked in blind. And while I would certainly say that this is par for the course for the last 10 years of Martin Scorsese, where a very long movie uh, a bit of a taxing viewing experience, not necessarily the most rewatchable film in his filmography by any stretch, but I was absolutely captivated by this story. And you know, it's just like with biopics, movies based off of somebody that I don't really know a whole lot about, I love historic movies if they're telling a really gripping story that I am not familiar with. And I absolutely was not familiar with this tragedy, this massacre of this uh, Osage community. And so from the very beginning, once I started to actually get an inkling of what the story was going to be, I was absolutely hooked. And little did I know that I was going to spend over the next two hours just bathing in tragedy and horror and misery. And it is a movie that I think justifies its long run time because it's really trying to just beat you over the head with how horrific these events were and how evil these people were that were just systematically one by one murdering people in this community to try to funnel their money into their pockets. And so as far as a storyteller, as far as a director, I think that Martin Scorsese did a fantastic job as he always does, but this is certainly one of the more effective jobs that he has done for me very recently. Thought that Leo DiCaprio was great as always. I mean, it kind of feels like <laughs> Even if he's outstanding, it's like, of course, what the fuck? It's Leo DiCaprio. The guy never misses. Uh, but very different character for him where he's kind of playing a bit of a nimrod. And even though he's the focus of the story, he is the the protagonist. Well, not really the protagonist, but he's the, he's the, the focal point of where you are experiencing this story from. He is the one that you are getting his viewpoint and his perspective and he's not really the, the the hero, the good guy, the smart guy. He's just a pawn 
to Robert De Niro, who is absolutely the mastermind and another amazing uh, performance by him as well, which, again, I would say just like with Leo DiCaprio is like, well, duh, it's Robert De Niro. But he's certainly over the last 20 years or so picked some oddball roles and, and phoned it in here and there. So it's good to see that once again, teaming up with Martin Scorsese brings out the best in his ability. And Lily Gladstone, somebody who is going up against quite literally the greats, Robert De Niro, Leo DiCaprio, even all the other people that fill out this ensemble cast. She is one of the lesser known names on here, and she holds her own and maybe is the standout of the movie as Leo DiCaprio's wife, who he is murdering her family one by one. And all the while, she doesn't realize that it's him. It's just an absolutely gripping movie a horrific piece of American history, and I thought that they did a fantastic job making this very epic retelling of it. And while it's not necessarily a, a movie, especially in this top 10, it might be the least rewatchable movie on this list, but it's a movie that I value my viewing experience with it, and I will remember 2023 for. Coming in at number nine is one of the bigger surprises of the year, and that is Gran Turismo. If you would have told me at the beginning of the year that a video game movie was going to make my top 10, I would have been like, you're out of your fucking mind. What video game movie? What's coming out? What's going to get absolutely demolished this time? And I think the trick with this one is that it's kind of a video game movie, but kind of not. It's really just a sports biopic that also has some of the Gran Turismo video game flavor. And that's where it's able to succeed where a lot of video game adaptations fail because there is a really interesting and captivating story that is in real life that they're able to just adapt here. And I didn't, again, just like with Killers of the Flower Moon, didn't have any idea what this movie was about or uh, what the actual true story was. I'm not a, a racing fan or a sports fan, so I've never heard of this guy. But the fact that there was a gamer who was so good at Gran Turismo that he actually got a, a shot at like this little boot camp, rose through the ranks, won, and was able to become an actual racer because of his skills in a video game. That's a really fucking cool and interesting story. And I think the movie does a really good job at bringing that forward in a really entertaining way. This is kind of harkening back to good old tried and true sports underdog stories and I really enjoy those when they're done well and this one is done well I think that the main character as well as the actor that's portraying him he was also in Saltburn uh, does a very good job and the character himself is somebody that you root for I really enjoyed David Harbour as the coach where he starts off very cynical and very uh, pessimistic towards the whole thing and you start to see this budding friendship and understanding between him and the main character that was really charming and it was just a really neat movie to take a true story that's already really interesting and they're able to put like this PlayStation skin on it to give it that video game flair and make it very unique. Uh, and Neil Blomkamp did a great job with that. The racing scenes are, are shot and uh, really well done, especially the crash scenes are intense as hell. The bits where you get like little PlayStation uh, heads up display stuff where it very much puts you into the flavor of the video game was really well done. They didn't even have to do that, and it still would have been a cool movie, but adding that PlayStation flair was like Easter eggs for fans. So this is a movie that, while it doesn't like aim for the stars with things like Killers of the Flower Moon, it was just such an entertaining movie and such a, a inspirational story that it's one of the movies that I've recommended the most in the past year. Coming in at number eight is going to be Saw X, the biggest surprise of the year. And just like with Gran Turismo, if you had told me back in January, hey, a Saw movie is going to be in your top 10, I would have told you, wow, it must be a absolute shit year ahead of me then because there's no way in hell that's going to happen. And Saw X is a movie that I was not bought in on whatsoever. I didn't think the trailers really did anything to impress me or convince me. This is a franchise that I like but only about half of them. And it's, it's absolutely been played out and done to death, in my opinion, before this. And so them saying, oh, we're going to go back and we're going to do another Saw movie and we're going to go back to the first two films and we're going to get Tobin Bell back. It was just like, you guys are just, just scraping the bottom of that barrel, aren't you? You got nothing else to do. And shame on me, because damn, this was the best Saw movie, in my opinion. I thought that the way they utilized Jigsaw and John Kramer as a character was really interesting and captivating and, and was strangely effective at making him the protagonist of the story and kind of the pseudo hero 
while we all know and acknowledge that he's a psycho and a killer. So that was a really cool thing that they did there. I think that they did a great job with setting up the traps. They're very nasty and gory and effective. I liked how they built out their relationship a little further with him and Amanda. They set up this rivalry with him and Cecilia that they can pay off in further movies, and I imagine they'll pay off later on this year. Uh, this is just a movie that maybe because my expectations were so low, I've enjoyed it so much more than I normally would have. But I love times wherever I just expect nothing from a movie and I'm the naysayer and everybody else is like, no, man, it could, it could be cool. I'm like, nah, don't even give me that shit. There's no way. Look at the track record. And then I see the movie and I'm able to come out and eat my words and tell everybody I was wrong. It's fucking great. Get excited because you're going to love it. I, I love having moments like that. And that was the moment of the year for me in 2023. Coming in at number seven, my favorite animated film of the year is Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem. And I'm somebody that I don't really get that enamored with animation too much anymore. Of course, we do have some great ones here and there. But I, I don't know, something about animation, I'm always at arm's distance with it. I will always prefer live action movies. But this year had some really good ones. We had Elemental that I was very surprised by. Of course, Across the Spider-Verse, which people will probably be shocked is not in my top 10, came very close. But Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Mutant Mayhem was the one that I enjoyed the most. I've always been a big TMNT fan. They were kind of the, the biggest thing that I was into in my childhood next to Power Rangers. And I have always wanted them to kind of get back to their glory days of those first two live action movies. You know, I, I've enjoyed aspects of like the Michael Bay movies. There have been certain animated iterations of this that have been fun enough, but there hasn't really been like a new iteration of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles that just felt like this really passionate new take on the characters that also resonated with me. And this one very much was that. Uh, it's taken them very much back to actual teenagers, which the, the trailer I wasn't sure on. And even in the movie, I feel like there's still a little younger personality than actual teenagers, but maybe I was just mature for a teenager, but they're very young minded and young personalities. They don't seem like adults that are being called teenagers. So that's a very different aspect uh, being an origin story to a degree where they're just now kind of coming out into the city, meeting April O'Neil, uh, kind of getting accepted and, and fighting and struggling with the lack of acceptance, which is a really nice little storyline and theme to be explored here. The animation style for for as great as Across the Spider-Verse was, which that's absolutely the most impressive as far as animation styles this year. This one gave it a run for its money with the, the, the drawing style and the different ways that they animate certain sequences. So on just an animation creativity side, it was very impressive. I loved a lot of the ways that they did a different take on some of these characters, uh, namely Splinter. And I'm very excited to see what they're going to do with Shredder. Uh, the only negative that I had with it really was that uh, as an old school TMNT fan, there are some new directions that they take regarding some of the classic villains in them. Not so much being villains in this new iteration, at least not yet, that I was a bit uh, I brushed up against that a little bit. I was like, I don't know if I like that. Those are villains. They need to stay villains. Uh, and I wish I could have saw more out of Baxter Stockman, but minimal issues with a movie that I really enjoyed. Can't wait for a sequel. And I'm even looking forward to seeing, I, I believe there's a Paramount plus TV series adaptation that's going to be coming from this universe too. So bring it all on. I'm ready for turtle power, baby. Coming in at number six is my favorite horror film of the year. And that is talk to me. This is a movie that was kind of quietly floating over the radar a bit. I didn't really know much about it. A lot of people were just talking about the fact that it was made by YouTubers. I walked into this one absolutely blind, had no idea what the story was. And also it being A24, while last year certainly got me into a better spot, a better relationship with A24, I'm still a little guarded because sometimes they're a little too out there and artistic and, and quirky for my taste. So I walk into this one not really having much of an expectation and what I liked about this the most is that it takes a familiar direction, a familiar subgenre in possession and does something really unique with it and really modern with it. And for a subgenre that fails to do anything unique with that concept 99% of the time, that was so surprising and refreshing to me. Basically, you got a bunch of kids here that have this cursed ceramic hand, and when they grab a hold of it, they're able to be possessed by uh, an entity and they treat it like a party game. Like they're all filming it and making TikToks and having like parties surrounding this uh, playing with the devil, basically. 
And then things go very wrong very quickly. And it's a movie that's very dark. It's very disturbing, especially with the images. I think that uh, the small scale, the small budget, and the creativity that comes out of that, this is a good example of it. I think for first-time filmmakers, especially being YouTubers, this was an outstanding achievement. And I definitely want to check out more by these guys. And even just the fact that YouTubers made something that was a critically acclaimed movie, it's like, thank you. Thank you. Carry the flag for the rest of us, boys. Uh, I really dug this. I think that it was very effective with what it was going for. And even though I think that it would survive very well as a one-and-done singular storyline, I think that there's enough potential here and things to expand upon with this world and this concept that I'm actually genuinely looking forward to talk to me too, or, or talk to me, whatever they end up calling it. Uh, I'm ready for a sequel. So I dug this one, ended up being my favorite horror of the year. Coming in at number five is Extraction 2. And I was so late to the party on Extraction. I think Netflix has just burned me so much with how many dog shit movies that I've seen from them that even the ones that people acclaim, I'm like, eh, whatever, I, I, I'll wait. I'm in no hurry. If it's Netflix, it can't be that good. So I did not watch the first Extraction until the weekend that Extraction 2 released. So I watched the first one, was like, damn, that was actually pretty fucking good. And then immediately clicked over to the second one. And for my money, the second one was even better. It was even cooler. It was more badass. The fight sequences were better. Uh, the action was better. There was like a 22-minute fabricated one-shot sequence here that was just captivating to watch as an action fan. It was like, holy shit, this is intense. This is great. And I'm just, I'm a huge fan of good old-fashioned, visceral, kick-ass, bare-knuckle action movies. And we don't get too many of those nowadays. You know, I, I know that my channel very much is, has a horror focus and I'm known more for talking about horror. But if there's any genre of film that rivals my love for horror, it's action. And while horror has been in a very healthy spot for the last number of years, action comes and goes. You have a lot of the big blockbuster franchises that carry the torch for it. You know, Marvel and DC is very much where we get a lot of our action nowadays, which is a bit depressing. But as far as just old school movies like this, physical stunts, actual people getting set on fire, uh, real shit, real explosions, all of that, the good old fashioned way of making action films, we don't get too many of those. And so that's one of the reasons why when I saw Extraction 2, I was like, oh, I need more of this. I don't give a shit if this makes 500, 600 million dollars. You can make little mid-level budget movies like this and I could take 10 of these a year. And so I loved what Extraction 2 did. I really like Chris Hemsworth in the role. And even though the story is very simple and very much kind of just a resurgence of what we did in the first film, we got to extract somebody, hence the title. You know, very simple, very basic setup. The fact that they do everything else so good, have a great lead character by a great captivating movie star, lead actor, badass action all the way through, intense, great pacing. I can forgive the simpler story. Would I prefer a bit more of a captivating story? Absolutely. But if it works well as just an excuse to get Chris Hemsworth to beat the fuck out of people, good enough. <laughs> yeah, I'll take it. And so Extraction 2 for me is probably much higher on my list than a lot of people. But as an old school action fanatic, man, this thing gave me what I needed. Coming in at number four is going to be Air, the new Ben Affleck film that came out earlier this year. Ben Affleck is absolutely one of my favorite working directors today. I don't think he's made even a mediocre movie like Live by Night is probably his his least successful effort. And I still think that was a very good film. Movies like Gone Baby Gone and especially the town in my top favorites of all time. So I've been waiting to see this guy direct something else. As much as I loved his take on Batman, and I was gutted that we didn't get his actual standalone Batman film, the biggest casualty of his time with the DC universe was that he didn't get to direct anything. It kind of took him away from all of that. So the fact that he came back and wanted to tell this story really interested me because I don't really get into sports. Of course, I know who Michael Jordan is. He's the biggest sports star, superstar of my lifetime. Uh, and of course, I know who Nike is, but 
Air Jordans, I could give a fuck. I've never owned a pair. I've never even considered buying a pair. So I was like, well, Ben Affleck directing this in the cast is the only reason I'm interested in the movie about how a shoe was created. And damn, if he didn't make the most entertaining and captivating and emotionally satisfying version of a shoe origin story that you could have ever come up with, it was awesome. So you have a really interesting story here where uh, another interesting tidbit that Matt Damon finally being directed by his best friend was very cool to see. But Matt Damon being this guy who works at Nike that before Michael Jordan was this big star and before they had the Air Jordan, which has gone on to be the biggest shoe in history, uh, he wanted to get this deal going with Michael Jordan as this up and comer and was just hitting blockades all throughout the way. And so it creates this non-conventional sports underdog story, very similar to Gran Turismo. Can you tell I like these two of them in my top 10? Where Nike and Michael Jordan, two of the biggest entities in history by this point, it makes both of them underdogs. And it does it very well. And I even liked the, the creative decisions made by Ben Affleck to where he doesn't ever really show Michael Jordan. He lets Viola Davis as Michael Jordan's mother be the face of the family and she's fantastic so it's one of the funniest if not the funniest movie of the year which you could take that to the bank coming from me because I think movies are just painfully unfunny nowadays a really captivating story very well directed extremely well acted by everybody yet another example why Ben Affleck is one of the greatest working directors today cannot wait to see what this guy does next Coming in at number three is going to be Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning. I would say part one, but I don't think we can call it part one anymore. Weird. Nonetheless, the newest Mission Impossible film, the newest example of why Tom Cruise is the ballsiest motherfucker in the world making movies today. I love this franchise. I don't think there's a single bad movie in the bunch. Even Mission Impossible 2, I have my fun with. And with especially the last one, being arguably the best of the franchise. It's my second favorite, but I, I totally understand why people love that one far above all the rest of them. Fallout was just incredible. Very big expectations. Even after last year with uh, Top Gun Maverick being like this explosive movie of the year, and the movie that kind of got people back into the movies again after the pandemic. Big expectations for this. For me, it satisfied all of them. I was a little bit worried with the part one thing, because we've had numerous examples over the last two years of movies that are a part one that don't tell a fully satisfying singular story. They leave way too much hanging in the balance and un unconcluded by the end of the film. And this is probably the only one that I can think of recently that actually feels like its own standalone movie. It sets up a lot of things that can be paid off later on, but it tells a cohesive concluded story that is satisfying and even if we have three years to wait till the next mission impossible film which we don't i'm satisfied i'm not dangling by a fucking thread like spider-man across the spider-verse left me you know love that movie but <laughs> come on man uh mission impossible dead reckoning yet again uh, an evolution of this franchise just going bigger doing uh, amazing action set pieces with tom cruise putting himself in harm's way for our sick enjoyment uh, it's struggles only because we have seen so many amazing stunts by Tom Cruise in this franchise that I don't think the best and most incredible ones that we've seen are in this movie, but that's a good ass problem to have. But so many different action sequences, so many different characters at play here, both returning characters that we love from this franchise, as well as new additions, Haley Atwell absolutely the standout in this movie loved her character did some really captivating stuff with Rebecca Ferguson and wrapping up her character arc uh, I, I think that the story that they're telling regarding AI which was a bit of a point of contention uh, with the the story direction of this movie I was actually really interested in it I thought it was a really nice change of pace a villain that is so far ahead of the IMF team and is so unpredictable that it was actually kind of creepy and unnerving and in a time where AI, uh, ironically, in movies themselves has become like this very big, dark topic of discussion, I thought that it was a very well-timed movie. So I enjoyed w what they did with this film. And for, a, again, an action fanatic and somebody who loves this franchise, it delivered pretty much everything that I wanted out of a movie from uh, this franchise, from these people, from Tom Cruise. 
So it delivered for me on all fronts. If there was anything negative that I had to say about it is that there was moments that you could tell they used some CG or some green screen that took me out of the moment a bit just because they are, are, are so adamant about doing things real and in camera and with actual people, namely Tom Cruise, but it easily forgiven for all the awesome things they did in this movie. So I loved it. Coming in at number two was the first movie this year that got me excited about movies, and that was John Wick Chapter 4. This move, this year started a little rough for me. You know, we had some decent movies, but it felt like for the first like three months of the year, we either had mediocre releases or bad releases. Like there was no movie that I loved for like three months. And it was even starting to reflect in my comment section where people were like, why you don't like anything anymore? And I'm like, I know I, it's not me. It's just, it's the movies. There hasn't been anything great. It's not my fault. <laughs> Stop yelling at me. And the night that I went to go check out John Wick chapter four, I didn't have massive expectations for it. Of course, this is a great franchise. I've liked all the movies. I've loved most of them. But John Wick Chapter 3, for my money, was a bit of a step down from the first two. Got a little bit too uh, strenuous with the, the credibility there and how much he's able to survive. And I thought the story was a little bit wonky there. So I walked into this one expecting maybe it's going to be along the same lines as 3, where I really like it, but not necessarily as tight or as well done as the first two films. And I fucking loved this thing. This ended up being my favorite of the franchise. It's massive. It's bloated. It's ridiculously over the top. It still strains a little credibility with how much Tom, Cru or Tom Cruise, how much Keanu Reeves is able to survive. But it, it went down easier for me in this movie. But if you thought that Mission Impossible was incredible at just having all these massive action sequences and set pieces tethered together, John Wick Chapter 4 was just like that on crack. And so, so many of these big, huge, high concept action set pieces just back to back to back to back for like almost three hours was an absolute action star boner. I mean, I just I was captivated with the amount of crazy shit they were able to do in this movie and how four movies in in a franchise that seems to push the envelope and what's even possible still continues to top itself. That also felt like something that I, I kind of walked in a little more realistic or pessimistic about this one is how are they going to top the shit they did in the second and the third one? And they did. I, I really like what they did with him as a character, the story that they went for here. Supposedly there's going to be a fifth one. It doesn't necessarily surprise me, but I also felt like they did a pretty good job at closing off the story. If this ended up being the last movie, and part of me kind of wishes it was, but uh, nonetheless, story-wise, I really dug that. I loved uh, Bill Skarsgård as the villain here. I thought he was probably the best villain of the franchise, and I loved what he brought to it and his kind of on-screen persona. I think they did a really cool job at continuing the, the very strained relationship between John Wick and uh, Wilson, uh, Ian McShane's character. And above all else, and this might sound silly, but at the at the mental state that I was three months into 2023, I'm just feeling like movies just weren't doing anything for me so far this year. The moment that just absolutely reignited my love for film and, and got me excited again for the rest of the year of film was when you get to the third act of this movie and you have this this woman, this radio DJ that comes on and the camera focuses on her lips on the microphone and I sat there and I, I thought, oh, that's a that's a neat little, I don't know if it's a direct callback, but that reminds me of the Warriors. That's kind of cool because I love the Warriors. All right now, for all you buppers out there in the city of lights. <laughs> and then she gives this little speech about, you know, having everybody converge onto John Wick. And then she plays the song and nowhere to run to. I was like, oh my God, they're fucking doing it. The Warriors. Yes, I love this movie. That, if I was to rank like, movie moments that I, that got me hyped in 2023 that might be number one because i just got so fucking excited at the fact that they did such a direct and tongue-in-cheek reference to one of my favorite movies and, and implemented it into here where it just felt so perfect and natural that like rejuvenated me for the rest of this movie so i loved john wick chapter four it's one of the movies that got me so excited for movies again this year and it's a franchise that, again, it's, it's satisfying my gritty action fan heart. 
and just continues to top itself. But my number one movie of 2023 is one that more or less kind of came out of nowhere for me, and that is The Iron Claw. And this is a very non-conventional pick for me for number one. If you look back at my lists of the past, I tend to always have like a big horror movie or a big action film or a big comic book film. I'm very much somebody that when they're good, I tend to gravitate towards more of the the rewatchable, exciting blockbuster type movies. I love my dramas and I love my smaller movies and my true stories and biopics and all of that. But uh, for some reason, the, the rewatchability of a lot of the bigger, more studio, exciting movies tend to reign supreme for me. And this was an odd year where we absolutely got some great examples of that, some of which are on this list. But the vast majority of the big, uh, successful, expecting blockbusters just tanked at the box office, both in box office as well as just reception by fans and critics. So many of them, especially in the comic book world, just dead on arrival this year. This is the year of flopbusters. And so when we're in a year where a lot of great movies this year, but for somebody that watched over 120 of them, the vast majority of the movies that I saw in 2023 fell into that two and a half to three and a half star range to where it's like, it's good. It's fine. It's watchable. It's okay. It's decent. And you kind of forget about them by the weekend. That's kind of the, the the tone that 2023 had for me, especially in the first three months of the year, as I was just talking about with John Wick Chapter 4. And so I found myself this year that a lot of the movie experiences that I ended up valuing so much more in the calendar year of 2023 was the ones that made some kind of an emotional impact on me or made some kind of an impact in getting me to think and having something that stuck with me in some way. I tended to value those experiences much more this year than I ever have before. And that's completely exemplified in the Iron Claw being my number one of the year, the one that I am going to remember 2023 for the most. A movie that I was not on my radar. I don't even know if I knew it was coming out until a few weeks before it did, and suddenly everybody was buzzing about it. You know, it came out right at the tail end of the year. I watched it like two days before Christmas Eve. And... I expected it to be good. I, you know, I'm not a wrestling fan. I didn't know anything about the details of this family, the Von Erich family. Uh, all I knew about it was the people that starred in it and people saying that it was emotional and devastating. And so that kind of gave me a bit of a hint that, okay, there's probably going to be some tragedy involved. Uh, and so I was very interested in, in seeing this story and seeing what some of these actors could do. Cause I'm very intrigued in seeing Zach Efron's career continuing to blossom uh, Jeremy Allen White, even more so, is somebody that I've really been a big fan of ever since Shameless, loved the bear, and now seen him do something like this. So he he probably would have bought my ticket above anything else, even if this didn't have a, bu a bunch of buzz. And so I got the screener for this. I sat down, went over to my dad's house, and I sat down and I watched this with him uh, two days before Christmas Eve. And it's a movie where, you know, you didn't really talk a whole lot when you watched it. You know, it's a movie that sucked you in and it's very depressing. It's very emotionally devastating. It's very heart wrenching. And when the movie was over, I remember my parents, they, they were like, what do you think about it? I was like, it was very good. It was very good. And I, and I knew in that moment, yeah, that, that, that'll probably crack my top 10. Definitely. And then it just stuck with me. And the more that I thought about the movie and the more that I kept going over specific scenes, especially the way that the movie ends, you know, this is a movie that's about this Von Erich wrestling family. For those like me that don't watch wrestling, don't know the history of this. They were the kind of the, the premier wrestling family, especially of Texas, but they're one of the most renowned and well-known wrestling families in wrestling history. And there was this quote unquote curse that just followed this family and just one tragedy after another befell them. And so you have a story that's presented where you have this father, Fritz von Eric, played by, uh, I always call him Robert Paulson. <laughs> I know Meatloaf is Robert Paulson, but he's the one who says the line, his name was Robert Paulson. So Holt McElhaney plays the patriarch of this family, Fritz von Eric, and he's somebody that always wanted to have the, the world heavyweight championship belt but for whatever reason, never quite got there. 
And the movie tells the story of him putting all of the weight of that on his sons. Uh, you have Kevin Von Erich played by Zac Efron. You have Carrie Von Erich played by Jeremy Allen White. You also have uh, two other brothers in there, one of which doesn't want anything to do with wrestling and just tragically keeps getting like shamed and pulled into it. And it's a story about the good of family and the bad of family. The good being the bond and the love and the, the the ties that these brothers have to each other and how they build each other up and they encourage each other and they work together and they go through hell together. And they all have kind of the same strengths and the same weaknesses as far as wanting to give their all to this and being able to physically do that and, and just become like monsters in the, the wrestling world but at the same time, letting their father's expectations just absolutely cripple and stifle their life to where that seems to be the only motivation when they wake up every day. And then, of course, the bad side of the family being exactly that. The father that puts all of his hopes and dreams, all of his imperfections, all the things that he wanted to achieve and puts all of that on his sons and very much tries to live through them. And what resonated with me so much about this movie was both of those things to where I am really close with my siblings. I'm the oldest of five. I've always been kind of the, the protector role. You know, I watched them constantly whenever they were little. And, you know, even as adults, I still try to once in a while, you know, guide them a little bit. I've always kind of felt like a father brother in a lot of ways. And so it, it resonated with me a lot, the, the closeness of, of siblings. You know, I, I have one brother that I, I've only seen sporadically over the last 13 or 14 years who I, I was the closest with because we, we, we went through some of the, the most dark times of our life together before he eventually moved. And so I've always had this tie to him while at the same time being very distanced from him. So that kind of stirred up a lot of that. And at the same time, the, the whole father-son relationship where I can tell you as a father one of the biggest things that I constantly wrestle with is drawing that fine line between guiding your kids and setting them on the right path while also kind of letting them carve their own path. You know, I love being able to put some of my passions out there and things that I love and things that I am very excited about and, and getting once in a while a reaction from my kids that mirrors that where they get excited about the same things for me, like movies and things like that. But at the same time, not like forcing my personality and forcing my passions onto them and letting them very much become their own people. And that that's something that any father will tell you they constantly wrestle with. And even the notion of trying to do what you think is best for your kids, where in Fritz von Erich's mind, it's I got to make them the best they can possibly be so that they can have this glory and they can have this belt and they can be world renowned and they can be celebrities and, and probably rich along with all of that. But also balancing that with, uh, again, letting them carve their own path, letting them make their own decisions, letting them have their own successes and failures and not just live your successes and failures. And so that is something, the two big elements and themes of this movie that, that just stuck with me. And I, I've been thinking about constantly ever since the credits rolled. And especially the way that the movie ends, which I'm not going to get specific with because I highly encourage everybody to please check this movie out when it's in theaters, when it comes out on Blu-ray, DVD, VOD, whatever. Whether you're a wrestling fan or not. But the, the, the two or three scenes back to back that this movie ends with. There's a phrase that I see people use in movie criticism, especially like on Twitter and more the, the, the influencer side of today's movie criticism that I roll my eyes at nine times out of ten when I, pe I read people saying it, which is it broke me. Anytime a movie is, is somewhat dramatic, like this scene broke me, this performance broke me, this movie broke me. And I always roll my eyes because it's just like, it's such an overused term that I, I just never believe it. The last 10 minutes of this movie decimated me. And I, I didn't show it when I was watching it with my dad. And it's, it's actually something where when I, when I think back over it in my head and try to tell people about it, 
I almost get more emotional doing that, like reliving it than I did in the moment. But the, the, the two or three scenes back to back that this movie closes out on and the lines of dialogue and the way that they're delivered by Zac Efron and by uh, some other characters in these scenes was some of the most emotionally devastating line delivery that I, could, I can remember in any recent time. And if Zac Efron especially doesn't get some kind of awards consideration, at least for this, like it, this is probably the biggest travesty as far as a, a, an award snub that I have seen since I've been doing movie criticism. So like I said earlier, with a movie that is not necessarily a movie that would that would traditionally be my number one of a year, uh, it would always be something like a Mission Impossible or uh, a Talk to Me. What this movie did for me as far as a viewing experience and as far as um, affecting me through its storytelling, through its performances, uh, through this very tragic real life story, it's very captivating. Uh, that's the movie experience that I'm going to walk away with in my back pocket and remember 2023 for the most. Uh, I, I gave my dad the DVD screener that we watched and said, hey, you, know, you keep this in case, you know, my, my brother or my uh, my mom wants to watch it later on. You can keep it. And the next time I see him, I'm going to take that DVD back because I really want to watch this movie again. And it's it's something where uh, every single day I've kind of I, I wish that I could pop this movie on again because it was just so emotionally potent and, and emotionally resonant and, and just it touched on things that are very, very important while being devastating to me. Things that I resonate with, it just, it, it, it's the movie experience that I can talk the most about that that's affected me the most in 2023. And so while it might not be the movie that I watch or rewatch the most on this list, uh, it's not a movie that I'm probably going to want to put myself through uh, as much as things like Extraction 2 or TMNT. It's absolutely my number one favorite movie of 2023. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed that, please click over here for all of my 2023 new release reviews. I'm also going to put my ranking of all of the horror films that I watched. There's 46 of them from 2023. Please like, share, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss my massive ranking of all of the films, 120 plus that I saw over the past year, and of course, all the movie experiences that we're gonna have in 2024. So thank you for watching, and as always, remember, opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.